responsibility of the judiciary, of the higher judiciary, the high courts and the supreme courts, to compel the executive to do their duty. And that is what was done in some of these cases, like the 2G case or the Colgate case, where the court said that it is clear that the CBI is not doing its duty. And therefore, we are now going to monitor the investigations being done by the CBI. We will ask the CBI to give us daily, to give us monthly reports, progress reports to us, and we will ensure, we will see if they are now doing their duty or not. If they still do not do their duty, then we can ask some other authority or we can create a special investigating team consisting of some, even some retired police officers or retired investigators who can investigate this matter, which they have done in a few cases. So this is one important role of the judiciary in corruption cases, that is to ensure that the corruption investigation is properly done by the police or by the CBI or by whichever authority or to set up some other authority to do that which is what they did in the 2G and the Colgate <coughs> cases. The other role of the judiciary is to ensure that we have proper systems to deal with corruption which work, which is the exercise that the judiciary Supreme Court tried to do in, the, uh, in that uh, Hawala case where they tried to make the CBI independent of the government. Or even in that Satendra Dubey's case, where they tried to ensure that a whistleblower authority is set up, that it did not do very much eventually is a different matter. But what I'm saying is that one of the <coughs> one of the uh, rights and responsibilities of the Supreme Court, as the Supreme Court has decided, is also to ensure that proper systems are in place. So that's why we had once filed long time ago, long time before the anti-corruption movement started, some in 1990s, in early 90s, we had filed this petition asking for the appointment of a Lokpal. This idea of a Lokpal or an independent anti-corruption investigating body has been there for a very long time. So we had filed that petition in the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, that petition just remained pending, 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 and thereafter it was overtaken by this whole Lokpal movement and with this <coughs> government law. Uh, <coughs> So, if you see overall to what extent has the Supreme Court succeeded or what, to what extent has the judiciary succeeded in doing these two jobs, which is firstly to ensure that there is an independent, credible and proper investigation into these corruption cases which are brought before the judiciary. And secondly, to what extent has the Supreme Court succeeded in ensuring that there are proper anti-corruption systems in this country, the answer, the honest answer to that would be to a very small extent. Though they have done so in a few cases, but those cases are very few and far between. I could tell you about at least another 20 cases that I have filed involving major acts of corruption, not just this Air India case, which is also pending, which was mentioned here, but the 4G scam, the mining scams, various other scams in which the matters, the, the submarine purchase scam in which they just remain pending in the courts for years, sometimes for decades altogether and often they come to be dismissed and sometimes they come to be dismissed. So therefore the record of the courts in even this there have been, as I said, some very fine examples, but those are exceptions rather than the rule. Similarly, even to put in place a proper institutional framework to deal with corruption, the Supreme Court has tried to do something from time to time, even for police reforms. They passed a judgment in 2006, 
But nine years after that judgment, that judgment still remains unimplemented and the, we have filed petitions, contempt petitions in the court, in the Supreme Court saying that, look, the authorities and the governments are violating your order, but unfortunately nothing has been done. One issue that Abhishek wanted me to deal with is how do I deal with these cases? What happens in such cases? So what happens usually is that uh, somebody who has some information, usually you can call him a whistleblower, who is an insider in the system, or sometimes even persons who are not insiders, who have just a good understanding of that particular area. Suppose it is uh, coal, coal mining licenses. So there was this young man, young lawyer called Sudeep Srivastav and some other people who had, who had tried to understand, who had been seeing what was happening in these coal licenses or coal mining leases that were being given. And therefore he had a good understanding and a good knowledge of all this. Coupled with then the CAG report came, both in the 2G case as well as in the coal case, as well as in the Air India case. In so many cases there have been CAG reports which have been highly useful and very instrumental in our being able to take that matter to the court. So you can get information either from an insider who is a whistleblower, you may get information from an outsider who has been following it, you may get information from some authority like the CAG who is auditing that particular area. Once you get, and today actually I get probably more information, the CBI lawyers complain to the court that I get more information than the CBI gets. And even sometimes when I file in the court, file notings of the CBI itself, the CBI lawyer has to ask me to give me also a copy because I don't have a copy. So what has happened is that with the collapse of the CVC as the whistleblowing authority and with its loss of credibility, people have started turning increasingly to a person like me that look, uh, at least he is one person who will try and do what he can by way of getting, taking this matter to the court or by way of exposing at least the scam in the public. He will at least do something with this information and therefore more and more people send this kind of information, whistleblowers or otherwise, to people like me hoping that something will be done about it. They don't expect anything will be done if they go to the CVC which has official powers to investigate such whistleblower complaints and official powers to protect such whistleblowers. But the CVC has completely lost credibility and recently two very corrupt people unfortunately have been appointed uh, to the CVC by this government <coughs> as the Chief Vigilance Commissioner and another Vigilance Commissioner. So therefore now of course nobody will go to the CVC anymore. So that is why one of the things that I am in the process of doing currently is to set up a citizen's whistleblower authority or a citizen's whistleblower forum which will have some of the finest and some of the most eminent people in this country, some of the most trustworthy people in this country in that authority and any whistleblower can send his complaint or send whatever information he has to the citizens whistleblower forum or authority and this authority will have some researchers working with them who will examine all this information, see whether it makes out a significant case of corruption, with whether there is adequate evidence to make out a significant case of corruption and thereafter decide what needs to be done with it whether it needs to be taken to the court by way of a PIL, whether it needs to be just exposed before the public or what. And of course to try and protect that whistleblower 
from administrative harassment and at least ensure that the authorities uh, do not victimize that whistleblower. Because in most cases we have seen, in virtually every case, whistleblowers get harassed administratively and victimized. In very few cases, they are uh, physically threatened, but in virtually every case, they are administratively harassed and victimized. And we have been saying this to the CVC in so many cases. I have personally gone to the CVC in at least, at least half a dozen cases and have told them that at least exercise your authority and tell the government not to harass this whistleblower. They are uh, harassing him, intimidating him by way of transferring, uh, suspending, etc. And you are not doing anything in this matter, but they have refused to do anything in those cases. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> that is some work in progress on which a public announcement is likely to be made soon about setting up of this citizen's whistleblower authority. So last I come to this question of uh, what is the role of people like you, young people like you in this country to deal with corruption or not just with corruption. How can you become citizens or what should you be doing to become citizens who at least do something, whatever they can, by way of making this country into a more just, into a more humane society. So the first thing, the first role of every young person, firstly of course, why are young people important? Young people are important for the future of any society because, firstly, Young people are the biggest stakeholders in the future of a society. Their whole life is before them. Unlike us who have passed through most of our lives, you people have your entire life before you and therefore you are the biggest stakeholder in ensuring that this society becomes a more just, humane and uh, uh, sustainable society. Today the manner in which we are going, of course everybody tells us that uh, our Prime Minister tells us that we will have this make in India, that we will make India